Now, triple negative breast cancer, as you are all aware, is the subtype of breast cancer that's characterized by the absence of estrogen receptor and HER2 receptors. And until very recently was a subtype that was considered to be more difficult to treat uh, because until very recently we had no targeted therapies. What I want to go through with you is how, in my opinion, almost dramatically, the, the, the treatment landscape is changing in triple negative breast cancer, which gives me a lot of hope uh, and I think will ultimately lead to substantially better outcome, uh, outcome of patients. Now, if you start with early triple negative breast cancer, in the past, we would have considered primary surgery in the majority of patients, uh, if, if, if operable, followed by adjuvant therapy. But uh, increasingly, we are shifting to neoadjuvant, preoperative chemotherapy, uh, even if patients are, are, are operable. And, and there are two very clear reasons. Uh, we, 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 we have obviously had already learned in the past that the outcome is generally similar, so there's no risk uh, in, in delaying the treatment. But the most important two points are, one is that by inducing a good response, we can downstage the tumor, which facilitates less invasive surgery, breast conservation rates go up. We can also now routinely do a sentinel lymph node biopsy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which reduces dramatically the need for axillary node clearances. And those patients who still need a, a node clearance, we can reduce the morbidity with targeted axillary dissection. So that's one, uh, one important point. But I think the second point is, is, is even more important. And that is we can divide patients into two groups, into a group of patients who have a, what we call a pathological complete response. And that's the disappearance of all, all invasive cancer in the breast and the lymph nodes at the time of surgery or in the second group of patients who still do have residual disease, which then is removed by the surgeons. Why is this important? Well, the reason why this is important is that we have clear data, for example, from this FDA meteor analysis that shows patients who do have a PAF CR here in red have a fantastic outlook, whereas patients who have residual disease left, even if that's removed, have a high risk of recurrence. And if you look at the hazard ratio for recurrence, it's 0.24. That's already pretty strong. But the hazard ratio for overall survival is 0.16. So it's a very, very clear link between an excellent response to neoadjuvant therapy and better and improved survival. But this would be irrelevant if we couldn't also change the outcome of patients who still do have residual disease. They have, in this context, the study of the, of the Japanese Korean group is, is in my opinion, absolutely critical because the group looked into patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, had residual disease at the time of surgery, and then randomized patients post-surgery to adjuvant capecitabin or observation. And as you can see, there's a massive benefit from having additional adjuvant chemotherapy after prior neoadjuvant therapy in reducing recurrences with a hazard ratio of 0.58 but also, and again, most importantly, improving overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.52. So we now can divide patients into a group that doesn't need escalation at the time of surgery because they already have a fantastic outlook. And we have, on the other hand, a, a group of patients who do have a high risk of recurrence, but we can modify this risk with additional chemotherapy in the form of capecitabine, or in the future also with trial options. I'll talk a little bit about what drugs are moving into this setting. Now, one of the questions that often comes up, does every patient with triple negative breast scans in the early setting need chemotherapy? <clears throat> and here are data from, from a large study from, from the Netherlands, where until very recently, patients who were node negative or had tumors less than two centimeters didn't really get uh, adjuvant therapy. So if you just look at the data from PREDICT NHS, patients who have T1 N1 tumors, you see the 10 year survival data and in gray, you see the results of patients who didn't receive chemotherapy. In yellow, those patients who did receive chemotherapy. And it's very clear the survival benefit is around 10% roughly in absolute terms. If you look at patients with node negative disease, T2 tumors, again, very similar picture, uh, absolute benefit between 7 and 10%. Uh. Those groups are very clearly considered now <laughs> neoadjuvant therapy, that would, 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 would what we would consider as the standard of care in most situations. But what about patients with T1 and 0 disease? 
If you look at patients with T1C tumors, so tumors between 11 and, and, and 20 millimeters, 7% benefit in overall survival from chemotherapy. Patients with T1B tumors, node negative. So these are tumors between six and 10 millimeters, really small tumors, 5% survival benefit from chemotherapy. And again, those groups of patients should routinely be considered for neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemo chemotherapy. Now, even in patients with a tumor less than five millimeters, there is still a 5% benefit in overall survival in terms of chemotherapy. And we really need to think about whether those patients should be treated as well. Are there any biomarkers can help us select patients with those very low risk d d d disease, whether they need chemotherapy or not? And this is where the Dutch study came into play. They looked at all patients with, with a 10, 15 years follow up and then looked at TILS, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, to basically assess what is the immune response in the patient and has this an impact on outcome. And as you can see, there are three groups, patients with low TILS, patients with intermediate lymphocytes, and that's the majority of patients. Those two groups are 80% of patients, and both have a relatively high risk of recurrence and therefore should clearly be considered for chemotherapy. But there may be a small group of patients, around 20%, which have, who have high TILS, so have a high immunity, and those patients may in the future, if you can verify this, be spared from chemotherapy. To take away from for now, patients even with low risk cancer, even T1 and NOT disease should be considered for neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy because it clearly improves outcome. Now, one of the big debates in, in, in oncology is if you give neoadjuvant therapy, should we or should we not include platinum agents? And you all know that there is a group of patients who are highly sensitive to platinum. And what we also have learned is the path CR rate with neoadjuvant therapy. So the complete disappearance of cancers with anthracyclines and taxines alone are around 35%. There are at the moment three randomized trials that used anthracycline taxane based chemotherapy with or without platinum. And as you can see from the results, it is very clear. There's a German study, there's an American study and an international study. All studies show very consistently a benefit from platinum in terms of pathologically complete responses. And if you look at the absolute values, 53, 54, 58%, so consistently above 50%, Whereas the control arm without platinum, 31, 41, 37%, around 35 to 40%, as we have known. So we can increase the path CR rate probably by 15, possibly even more percent in patients. What's the price for this? Well, the drug is financially very cheap and available in all parts of the world. But in terms of toxicity, the added toxicity in our experience is relatively low. And therefore, our recommendation and it would be to consider this in patients with triple negative breast cancer. Why is it not at the moment in all guidelines? The reason for that is we have limited long-term follow-up. Two of those studies, and both studies were relatively small, in a few hundreds, but not a few thousands. The German study showed a significant benefit in reducing recurrences with platinum. As you can see, there's a 9% difference in disease-free survival, has a ratio of 0.56, that's pretty impressive and for me personally convincing. The American study, on the other hand, showed also numerically a 5% difference. But with, with the size of the study, that was not considered significant with a hazard ratio of 0.84. And for the third study, we haven't got data. So in the absence of this long-term survival benefit that hasn't been demonstrated, some guidelines will still say you don't have to give platinum to everyone. Some people choose to give it to suboptimal responders. Some people choose to give it just to BRCA mutant uh, 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 patients. But, but increasingly sites, and, 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 and for example, our site, which is specially, uh, specialized in triple negative breast cancer, would increasingly incorporate this into standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on the consistently higher path CR rates. Now, what about adding PARP inhibitors to platinum-based therapy? And this was a, a question that came out of the ISPY2 program, where the combination of veliparab and carboplatin with taxane anthracycline-based chemotherapy led initially to higher path CR rate. And so the Brightness study was set up, which is a phase three trial, which, which essentially looked at 
three different combinations, paclitaxel alone, followed by AC, or paclitaxel and carboplatin, followed by AC, or paclitaxel, carboplatin, and the PARP inhibitor, followed by AC. This was in the neoadjuvant adjuvant setting, at stage two or stage three patients, BRCA wild type or BRCA mutant. And the results are very clear. The results confirm the platinum plays a role, but it also shows that the addition of PARP inhibitors to platinum-based therapy in an unselected group of patients does not provide any benefit. We need to wait for long-term follow-up data, but at the moment, there's no role for PARP inhibitors in combination with platinum in a new adjuvant setting. What about immune therapy? Now, we, we, we spoke about immune therapy in this setting before, and as you remember me saying, immune, the interaction between the cancer and immune therapy and the immune system is complex. And it starts at this, if you look at this cancer immunity cycle, it starts the left bottom corner with the release of cancer cell antigens. This can happen spontaneously, but it can also happen, or more importantly, happen through chemotherapy or radiotherapy or possibly any other effective anti-cancer therapy. Now, these cancer cell antigens are then taken up in antigen-presenting cells. It leads to priming and activation in central lymphatic organs. The T cells have to find their way back to the tumor, infiltrate the tumor, recognize cancer cells, and then start killing cancer cells. And the question I often ask is, how do immune checkpoint inhibitors, the new form of immune therapy, drugs targeting PD-1 or PD-1, drugs such as atezolizumab or pembrolizumab, how do those immune checkpoint inhibitors, where do they work in this cancer immunity cycle? And the, the answer is very much in the periphery. They, they enable the killing of cancer cells because the, 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 the checkpoint that controls this interaction is PD-1, PD-1 driven, but they have very little impact on the rest of the cancer immunity cycle. So in order to optimize the effect of treatment, we ideally need to tackle this immunity cycle at more than one level. For example, which sounded initially counterintuitive, but with the combination of chemotherapy, which has several pro-immune effects. It releases cancer cell antigens, it reduces the regular T cell activity, T rec activity, and T rec cells are like a big foot break, damping any form of immune response. So if you take the foot break away, the immune system gets activated. And it increases PD-1 and CD8 levels. We've just shown that, uh, we will present this in San Antonio, that in patients who are PD-1 negative, with just two weeks of immune therapy, almost 70% of those patients turn PD-1 positive. So this is how quickly this, 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 this system can change. And we are looking at different ways of combining chemotherapy or combining immune therapy with other treatments, chemotherapy being the first generation, but we also work on the second and third generation already. Now, what data have we got in early breast cancer in terms of immune therapy? Well, there are two phase three trials I want to share with you. Both are in stage two and stage three uh, 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 disease. So not that they're very small tumors and both looked at giving chemotherapy in combination with immune therapy. Our study was the larger one with nearly 1,200 patients, two to one randomized. And the chemotherapy we chose in our study was the most effective, not to say the most aggressive chemotherapy anyone could choose uh, with, with carboplatin, paclitaxel for 12 weeks, followed by AC or EC for, for, for 12 weeks, all the way through with either immune therapy, pembrolizumab or placebo, followed by surgery, patients remain blinded and then we continue with immune therapy or placebo. The trial had two endpoints. We look at a short-term endpoint, PAFSI, our disappearance of all cancer, but we also look at long-term recurrences in the form of event-free survival. There's a second trial in PASHN 031, which was presented a month ago at ESMO, smaller trial, only 333 patients, one to one randomized. The main difference is it uses a platinum-free chemotherapy backbone. So not optimal chemotherapy, now paclitaxel followed by AC with or without a, 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 a tezolizumab uh, or placebo. And patients were unblinded at surgery and then continued either with immune therapy or were just followed up. And therefore, the primary endpoint is only looking at PAFCR because the study is just too small to look at long-term outcome. Groups of patients were very similar. In our study, 5 to 2, we had slightly more no positive patients, 52% compared to 38% in passion 031, but otherwise very, very similar. If you look at the primary endpoint of both trials, 
Pathia, complete disappearance of all cancer. You can see both trials are clearly positive. In Keto 5 to 2, we pushed PATH-CR rate from 51%, which is already high with standard chemotherapy, platinum-based, to almost 65%. That's a nearly 14% difference, highly significant. And in Passion 031, we also increased the PATH-CR rates from a lower level, 41% without platinum chemotherapy, to 57%, so it's a 16% difference. Very, very comparable data, just starting at a slightly lower level if there's no platinum in the chemotherapy. I want to share two subgroups with you, which I think are both really, really interesting and, and, and really important. The first one is looking at PATH-CR rates in node positive and node negative patients. Now, you all are aware that PATH-CR rates in node positive patients are generally lower than PATH-CR rates in node negative patients. That's not rocket science. If you have a more advanced cancer, you tend to have more residual disease. And that's what both trials show in the control arms. But what is really interesting, if you look at the node positive patients, you see that they have ident identical outcome to node negative patients when they receive immune therapy. In other words, in patients in the control arms with chemo alone, puff CR rate lower, as we know, 44% versus 59% if they're node positive compared to node negative. In the impartial node through one, only 30% to 49% node positive versus no negative. But if you look at the, at the immune therapy treated patients, there's no difference. So if you're node positive, you have the same chances of having a path CI, this high risk group, as node positive patients, providing you get immune therapy. What's behind there is possibly a priming effect of the immune system with the cancer already being in some lymphatic organs. That's at least our theory at this point in time but really important observation consistent in both trials. The second subgroup I want to share with you is PDL1 positive versus PDL1 negative. You will see a little bit later when we talk about metastatic disease that immune therapy works in a metastatic disease, but only in patients with PDL1 positive tumors. Now, interestingly enough, in the in the immune in the neoadjuvant setting, the outcome is or well, the benefit of immune therapy is the same whether patients are PD-1 negative or PD-1 positive. We know that PD-1 positive patients respond better to chemotherapy, which we could show as well. But on top of that, patients will have a benefit of immune therapy, whether they're no negative or no positive. The same, again, was seen in Passion 031, making those data much more robust. Same observation, no uh, PD-1 positive patients benefit to the same degree as PD-1 negative patients. We also looked at whether there are groups of patients with a better cutoff of, of, of for PDL1, whether they have a better benefit. If you look at higher PDL1 expression, you, what is interesting, you get a group of patients with a slightly inflamed tumors, and that's a large group of triple negative breast cancer who have a nearly 80% path CR rate, but they still have the same benefit from immune therapy. So, in other words, all patients seem to at the moment qualify for immune therapy. What about long term outcome? Very, very early days, 50 months follow up, but you can clearly see the curves are separating. We have a 6% difference in 18 months event free survival rates, a hazard ratio of 0.63, so all nearly a third of, re re of recurrence is reduced, although this is not yet statistically significant using the, the pre specified P, P value boundary, which was 0.0051. So we hope that we will fairly soon see more data on that, and that makes that positive. If you look at side effects, you see in green side effects with chemo and immune therapy, in pink side effects just with chemotherapy. And this is during the chemotherapy phase, practically no difference. If you look at the adjuvant phase where patients only received immune therapy, Again, there's practically no difference between placebo and immune therapy. If you want to see some of those immune therapy side effects, we have to look very carefully at, at, at predefined events. And the most common one is changes in the thyroid function, whereas the other side effects, pneumonitis, colitis, hepatitis, seem to be in the 1% range and very easily manageable. Now, a little spanner in the work was a trial by the Italian group. That's, that's a smaller study. It was two to one randomized and uses a very unconventional chemotherapy regimen all the way through for, for, for many, many weeks with carboplatin, now paclitaxel, as you can see, no anthracycline with and without a tesalizumab. 
And this study that had antracyclines after surgery was designed to look at long-term outcome first and PATHCIA is only a secondary endpoint. But they presented the data for PATHCIA in San Antonio and it was essentially negative and didn't show a clear benefit. Now, what I personally take from that is, is we have two phase three trials that are clearly positive. We have a smaller study that's in its secondary endpoint PATHCIA not positive, but also uses a very unconventional chemotherapy. And that highlights for me the fact that if you do give immune therapy, you need to stick to the chemotherapy regimens we chose in those trials, because it seems to be that the sequential strategy with taxanes with the platinum followed by anthracyclines really enable an immune response, whereas other strategies may not do this. So do, where do we stand with this in, in early breast cancer? We, are, we still need to wait for the long-term benefit of immune therapy and also need to see the penal one, which is not predictive of response, may also not be predictive of long-term outcome, but that's something we still need to, to see. There's still some questions around the chemotherapy regimens as I share with you, the sequential regimens, taxine followed by AC, have both shown a benefit uh, that suggests that we, we need to keep anthracyclines in, but we also need to work out, do patients really need platinum or not? The contribution of atuan therapy is less clear, and we will have to work on patient selection, which patients have the maximum benefit or patients do already well without immune therapy. There's a number of concepts ongoing in the neoadjuvant setting we discussed, but also starting immune therapy later, giving it an adjuvant setting, or even giving it single agent in suboptimal responders. And there are several concerns around, especially the adjuvant settings, because as the cancer is removed, we may not have the full immune response anymore at that point in time. Studies are ongoing and we will see what, what we get. Where we're heading at the moment, it's clear in, 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 in different directions. If you look at stage one triple negative breast cancer, we are now debating whether we can create de-escalation strategies. And from a research point of view, you're looking in chemo-free ADC, for example, combinations in that setting, and then only escalate if patients have not a PATHCR at the time of surgery. In stage two and three disease, which is what I was sharing with you with immune therapy, we have a new standard chemo and immune therapy, hopefully very soon, we need to look at the role of platinum. We also need to identify optimal responders, maybe through TILS, maybe the pedal one. But then at the time of surgery, patients who have apathia, we will need to define, do they really need more immune therapy? But patients with residual disease, we're looking at more effective strategies, chemo plus, uh, different chemotherapy with immune therapy, or possibly antibody drug conjugates. Now, when we move to the metastatic setting, it is... The treatment options are very much dependent on what we have used in the early setting. If a patient had anthracyclines, taxane, platinum, and capecitabine, there's little left. But we would always say, and that's what we said until 2017, taxanes are a standard if patients had at least a year disease-free. Otherwise, it is platinum. And when it comes to second and third line, we just choose what hasn't been given with the ribulin being an important treatment there. But if you go back three years ago, the median survival in metastatic TMBC was only around 12 to 15 months. But we are in the process of changing this substantially, I would I was saying dramatically. And one, of the one of the basis for that is that we're understanding the biology of triple negative breast cancer increasingly. It's a very heterogeneous disease. There are different subgroups. For example, the, the, the Baylor College identifies four subgroups based on gene expression profiles. Others define six subgroups. I don't think it is worthwhile remembering these subgroups because I think in the future we will use different treatment-defined classifications. But I do think it is helpful to be aware of them because what they just emphasize is the, 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 the different biologies that drive triple negative breast cancer. Well, the first targeted therapy we all are aware that was used was PARP inhibitors in that small subgroup, 10, 15% of patients with BRCA1 or 2 wild type mutations. And that was based on two randomized trials that used in a first line, second or third line setting, PARP inhibitor or standard chemotherapy with the exception of platinum that was not allowed in this trial. And as you can see, it clearly improved progression-free survival, but it did not improve overall survival. 
Response rates are impressively high with PARP inhibitors, but so are they with, with platinum in, in BRCA mutant patients. And what is really important and is not on the slide is the response rate remain high in a first line, second and third line setting. First line response rates are in the high 60s, but in second or third line, still 55 and 50%. Because so if you don't give PARP inhibitors in first line setting, they're very effective salvage therapies in second and third line, or platinum may give a similar benefit. There's interesting data now coming out around the role of PARP inhibitors in, 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 in other groups of patients who have do you have a weakness in DNA damage and repair, but that's not based on BRCA germline mutations, but for example, on somatic BRCA mutations or on other type of germline mutations. As you can see, PALB2 or somatic BRCA mutations response rate between 30 and, 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 and nearly 40%. And that's hypothesis generating, and we will have to do more trials to confirm this. If you look at the second group, there's a, a group of patients who are AR androgen receptor positive, they look like hormone-driven breast cancer, they behave like hormone-driven breast cancer. Uh, we have data with enzalutamide, bicolutamide, about one in three patients response. We're working on combination strategies with CDK4, 6, and PR3 kinase inhibitors to make that work better, that we can also run phase three trials in, 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 in this setting. One of the big steps forward in AAA of breast cancers are and will be antibody drug conjugates. And I just want to share one of them with you. You know the concept of antibody drug conjugates. It's an antibody that has, through a linker, a, 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 what we call a payload, a potent drug bound to it. And sagituzumab is, is probably the leading ADC antibody drug conjugate in triple negative breast cancer. It uses as a chemo payload, uh, uh, SN38, which is much more potent than uh, the parent compound, arenotecan. It targets something called CHOP2, and that's really interesting. Most of you probably will have never heard of CHOP2, as I didn't before we worked with the drug. The reason for that is CHOP2 is not important. CHOP2 is not an oncogenic driver in breast cancer. But what CHOP2 does, it's very often on, on the surface of cancers. And so what we use sacituzumab for, we use CHOP2 as an anchor to bring the drug to the cancer, it anchors there, doesn't matter whether it slows the cancer down or not, but then the bomb with the, with the chemotherapy drug basically goes up and kills effectively those cancer cells. And because it has a hydrolyzable linker, it also has a bystander effect and, 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 and can destroy some of the cancer cells around there. Now, Sagituzumab, we, we, we had the phase one data a couple of years ago, which are really, truly remarkable. Now, these were patients with at least two, some three, four, five, six lines of treatment in the metastatic setting for triple negative breast cancer. Nothing usually works there. And as you can see, these are the so-called water flood pole plot. Oh, everything from the dotted line that goes down shows a patient had a reduction in size, which is massive, massive reduction here. If you look at the swimmer plots here down uh, in the bottom half of the slides, it sees how long patients stayed on that treatment. Some of them for 12, 18, 24 months. And if you look at the metrics, a third of patients had objective responses, duration of response nearly eight months, overall survival 30 months. That is massive in this pretreated cohort of patients. And if you think this was only patient selection, look at this left half of the slide, where in blue, you see the time patients spent on sacituzumab, the new drug. In red to the left, you see the time patients spent on the immediate prior treatment. And for example, if you take the third patient from the top who was on the previous treatment for two months and progressed and then stayed on sagituzumab for nearly two years. So it's not just patient selection can clearly transform the biology. And as a result, the phase three trial, which was finally presented at ESMO, was clearly positive. Now, this is a randomized trial called Ascent, uh, we, which we were part of, which Louis Sakituzumab versus treatment of physician's choice as a third, fourth, fifth, sixth line therapy, proper chemotherapy. Most patients received a ribolin looking for progression free survival, which was clearly positive. Hazard ratio is 0.41, almost treble progression free survival in, in, in these patients. But also, if you look at uh, whether patients needed earlier or later. If you see patients with uh, two or three prior therapies have the same benefit, 
as patients who had four or five or six prior therapies, the uh, same patients who started with TMBC or started with ear positive disease have the same benefit. Now, one point that's really important is response rates. Now, when you get to this setting, third line, fourth line, fifth line, patients often are symptomatic. In order to get a symptomatic improvement, we need to make those cancers shrink. And the response rate with chemotherapy is, is practically not there. But if you look at the response rate with sagituzumab, 35% compared to 5% with chemotherapy, that's a massive shift. And therefore, it's not a, a surprise that it also led to an improved survival, hazard ratio 0.48, doubling of survival. So this will be access, obviously, permitting the new standard in a third, fourth, fifth line setting of triple negative breast cancer. Now, you may be pleased to hear that we're already working on a different antibody drug conjugate with a different biology in, uh, if we're targeting CHOP2, which we hope may be even better in this setting. So the, the, the field is moving forward very, very rapidly, but we've got a new standard and heavily pretreated patients. Now, another target that is very close to my heart is AKT inhibitors. And AKT is a pathway many of you are aware of, and it's often demonstrated with PR3K, AKT, mTOR in one line, and everyone thinks it's a, it's a linear pathway. But what I want to share with you is it, there's, there's a huge part of the AKT pathway, that's all you see here in pink and in green, that does not go through mTOR. And in fact, AKT has an important function in keeping cancer cells alive when we give chemotherapy, therefore causing resistance but also making cells grow faster. So it's a key driver of resistance and, and, and proliferation in triple negative breast cancer. And so we run two randomized phase two trials, first line setting paclitaxel with and without AKT inhibitors. Now these are smallish studies, so don't expect very fancy curves with just 140 an hour, 124 in the second study. But in the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, both show unselected patients hazard ratio of 0.74, 0.6, clear signal. But more importantly, when we look at overall survival in these phase two studies, hazard ratio, again, 0.6, improving me median survival from 12 to 19 months in the other study from 16 to 25 months. So clearly very promising signal. We're still working on the biomarker, studies are ongoing, and hopefully this will help us to also improve outcome in triple negative breast cancer. The last two or three minutes, I want to spend again on immune therapy. Now, this time in metastatic setting, we already spoke about immune therapy and the, and the rationale in the early disease setting. When we started giving immune therapy in metastatic triple negative breast cancer about seven years ago, we, we did single agent treatment trials. And there are three important things you can learn from those single agent trials. The first thing is it works. There was clearly single agent activity, which came, which was good to see, but it was not necessarily expected as breast cancer is not the most immunogenic tumor. And we saw response rates in around 25% in the first line setting. But the second observation was equally important. And it is in second or third line treatments, indications, the response rate drops dramatically. And it drops to around 5% from 25%. And what that means is, is if you give immune therapy too late, it's not going to work because the stroma becomes too immune suppressive, the, the, the immune cells too exhausted. So we really take from there, if you give immune therapy, give it early on. The third learning from those single agent studies is if immune therapy works, it transforms the cancer biology. And you remember this was a time when the median survival was around 12 to 15 months in, in patients, and these are pre-treated patients where it should be shorter. The median duration of response in our study was 21 months. And as a result, you can see survival of patients who responded in green, survival of patients who had stable disease in blue, survival of patients who progressed in red, clearly transforming the biology. We set up a phase three trial at that time looking at single agent therapy versus chemotherapy before we had the results of the, of the, the study I just shared with you. And that unfortunately was set up in second, third line setting. So as you know, the response rates are low in an unselected group, but as a result, the trial was negative. Negative meaning it was not better than standard chemotherapy, as you can see on the left top corner, 
But also, if you look at PDL1 positive patients, right top corner, left bottom corner, not better. But there's a group in the right bottom corner who have very immunogenic tumors, which with a high, very high PDL1 score, where actually, if you select the right patients, immune therapy can even be better than chemotherapy, even in a second or third line setting. And that's something we need to, we need to focus a little bit more and learn more from. But the future is clearly around combination therapy of, of, of immune therapy with chemotherapy. And there are two phase three studies, pivotal studies I want to share with you. The first one was our own Passion 130 trial, uh, which came out two years ago. And then this year we, we presented a second study, Keynote 355. They're both very similar. Similar in that way, they're both first line studies of metastatic triple negative breast cancer. The differences are in Passion 130 used now paclitaxel as chemotherapy backbone. The reason for that was we were a little bit anxious about giving steroids in that setting. And as we had only a taxane, we needed a 12 months disease free interval. And we used a biomarker called SP142. The Kino 345 trial, apart from using a pembrolizumab then, rather than atezolizumab, had three differences. We, we, patients and doctors could choose between chemo, not paclitaxel, paclitaxel or gemcarbo. It was, uh, as a result, it also included patients with slightly earlier recurrence, six to 12 months as well were included, and it used a different biomarker called CPS rather than SP142. But the sign was very similar, co-primary endpoint for progression-free survival and overall survival, and the patient populations were very similar. So are the results. If you look at the primary endpoint progression-free survival, and here in PDL1 positive patients, it's a subgroup of patients, around 40% of all patients. You can see hazard ratio with atezolizumab 0.62, with pembrolizumab 0.65, basically identical results. Now, what is really interesting is if you look at, <coughs> at PD-1 positive patients, we see all that benefit. But patients with PD-1 negative tumors seem to have no benefit at all. Clear interaction with this. We see the same results when we look at overall survival data. It's only patients with PD-1 positive tumors. The Keynote 355 trial allowed us to do two additional conclusions. We can use platinum-based chemotherapy as well. And patients with earlier disease recurrence between six to 12 months seem to benefit as well. What about survival? The only data available are from our Impassion 130 trial at the moment, where the final OS data show a hazard ratio of 0.67 in PD1 positive patients, improving overall survival by seven and a half months from 17.9 to 25 months. So we've come a long way. We are now beyond two years survival in these patients. And again, all the benefits seen in PD1 positive patients, no benefit in PD1 negative patients. So, how will we select patients for immune therapy, combination therapy, metastatic breast cancer? You've heard of PD1 testing, I mentioned it. We can test PD1 in different ways, and that can be a little bit confusing. Some tests look at tumor cells, others at immune cells, others at the combination. We have different ways of counting the cells, different cutoffs, but most importantly, different antibodies. And I will share the next two or three slides, some data with you with the two main assays uh, called with the SP1 for two antibody or Roche with atezolizumab or the two to C3 antibody or Merck with pembrolizumab. And when we looked at impartial 130 with the SP1 for two assay, we, we saw there's about 40% positive checking on immune cells. Tumor cell staining is very low in breast cancer, not the right assay to be used. And that's really important. We also compared different assays. We looked at whether the results differ when we use primary or metastatic tissue, and it doesn't, as you can see very clearly here. But what I want to bring your attention to is there are differences in PD1 expression between different metastatic sites. For example, lower expression in liver meds, and that's probably an area you shouldn't biopsy if you want to test for PDL1. When we compared the different assays in the same study, we saw that with atezolism, most of the benefit is clearly seen with one assay, whereas the other assay, which give different results, don't show that, 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 that benefit. But what is interesting to see is different assays describe different populations. And if I look at the two to C3 assay, which was used in the Merck study, they use two different cutoffs, and that can be very confusing. Now, with, a, 
with SP142, atezolizumab, we worked with a 1% cutoff that was based on counting immune cells. With the CPS assay, it counts immune cells and tumor cells and, and different types of immune cells. And therefore, a 1% cutoff is 80% positive compared to 40% positive with the SP142 assay. So completely different assays. When we then compared those assays, we found out a 10% cutoff with, with the CPS is similar to a 1% cutoff with SP142, where they largely overlap. And this is what we're using in the clinic now. So to summarize, where are we in, in, in early and metastatic breast cancer? In early triple negative breast cancer, the standard is increasingly neoadjuvant therapy, and I would add in platinum. We have established immune therapy as a new standard in this setting. Patients who don't have POFCR should receive post-operative capecitabine therapy uh, or, or neoadjuvant therapy, and therefore clear shift to the neoadjuvant setting. If you look at the metastatic setting, we have a new standard of care with introduction of immune therapy in pdl one positive patients. We also have PARP inhibitors, a new standard of care in patients with BRCA1 or 2 wild type mutations in the first, second, or third line setting. We will see data with AKT inhibitors in the not too distant future, where we'll need to work about on patient selection. We have this sagituzumab here under the old name, IMU132, a clear new standard in the third and subsequent line therapy. And we still have anti androgen receptor treatment. So the, the, the picture for metastatic and for early triple negative breast cancer is becoming very variable, very colorful, and the outcomes of patients are improving dramatically, but there's still a long way to go. Thank you very much.